Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the 115th Landon Lecture on Public Issues. The Landon Lectures were established in 1966 by the late Governor Alf Landon and then President James McCain in order to bring the leading public figures to Kansas State University to discuss the pressing issues of the day. We are very pleased to have as our speaker today Congressman Henry Hyde of Illinois chairman of the House Judiciary Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives. Before continuing my introduction of Congressman Hyde, I would like to introduce other members of the platform party. On my left, Dr. Buddy Gray, professor of history and president of the Kansas State University Faculty Center. <laughs> Next to him is Jason Heindrich, Senior in Industrial Engineering and President of the Kansas State University Student Body. <laughs> On my right is Edward Seaton, Editor-in-Chief and Publisher of the Manhattan Mercury. <laughs> and next to him is Dr. Charles Reagan, Associate to the President and Chairman of the Landon Lecture Series. And let me introduce a few other guests who are here today that we're very happy could make our Landon Lecture today. Congressman Jim Ryan. <laughs> Regent Floris Jean Hampton. Floris, there she is, thank you. And I think State Representative Jeff Peterson is here as well. Jeff, very happy to have you here today. <laughs> Congressman Henry Hyde represents the 6th District in the state of Illinois and has been an outstanding member of the United States Congress for a quarter of a century. He is a member of the International Relations Committee and is chair of the very powerful House Judiciary Committee as you will recall, it was his Judiciary Committee which first heard evidence and arguments for the impeachment of President Clinton. And then, when the House voted the article of impeachment, Mr. Hyde, representing the U.S. House of Representatives, was the lead prosecutor in the impeachment trial before the United States Senate. Congressman Hyde graduated from Georgetown University and received his Doctorate of Laws from Loyola University School of Law. During World War II, he served in the U.S. Navy from 1942 to 1946 in the Pacific. Congressman Hyde has been an attorney in private practice, specializing in litigation, and was the past president of the Trial Lawyers Club of Chicago. He served in the Illinois State General Assembly. He is the recipient of six honorary degrees and has been the recipient of a very long list of prestigious honors and awards. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Congressman Henry Hyde to the Landon podium. Congressman? Thank you very much, President John Weefald and Dr. Reagan, my dear friend Jim Ryan, Senator Pat Roberts is not here, but I admire him immensely. I served with him for many years in the House, and uh, uh, the same thing for Senator Sam Brownback. You are indeed a blessed state to have such great representation, and of course the remarkable and marvelous Nancy Kassebaum uh, is still shining her wonderful light on uh, our great country, and so uh, I'm very proud and very flattered to have been invited to deliver this uh, lecture today. I was somewhat taken aback by the warm ovation that I received when I came out here. I remember the words of Bishop Fulton Sheen some years ago. He said, when they applaud at the beginning of your speech, that's faith, and when they applaud in the middle of your speech, that's hope, uh, and when they applaud at the end of your speech, that's charity. So. Uh, 
I look forward to your charity. <laughs> you know, uh, I've been in Congress 25 years, and I must say uh, the years have taught me a great deal. You know, we don't use the term senior citizen anymore. We say chronologically gifted. <laughs> but my subject today uh, is the relationship between our culture and our public life, between our culture and politics. It's a topic that has been vigorously debated for years, but the horror at Columbine High School outside Denver earlier this year gave that debate a new sense of urgency. In the wake of the Columbine massacre, Americans of widely divergent views agreed that something had gone deeply, fatally wrong in our national life, and they sensed correctly, in my view, that that something involves our culture. Since Columbine, public commentators, religious leaders, and politicians have all related a lengthy list of horror stories, a catalog of decadence of key sectors of American culture. Some may find this cataloging distasteful. I welcome an airing of our cultural dirty laundry, for too many of us prefer to ignore the sewage around us. Being reminded of just how low things can and do get is salutary. Accurate diagnosis of a disease is the first step towards a cure. But I don't propose to add to the catalog of horribles today. Various remedies have been proposed for dealing with the problem of a toxic culture. A distinguished bipartisan group of public figures has called upon the entertainment industry to police itself much more stringently through voluntary self-adopted measures. Others have gone farther, proposing a reinstitution of censorship. They point out that no civilization in history before our civilization has ever thought it possible that society could tolerate a free fire zone in images and words. These and other proposals for both private restraint and public boundary setting merit the most serious consideration, but I don't wish to address them today. Rather, I would like, what I would like to do is take the conversation a little deeper, if I can, by thinking out loud with you about what we mean by culture and what we mean by politics. Then I would like to suggest why, in politics properly understood, culture properly understood counts a great deal. In the post-Columbine debate, culture has largely been identified with certain artifacts, certain things, movies, videos, CDs, websites, and so forth. Those artifacts suggest one possible definition of culture, but they leave us on the surface, I think. Culture is more than the works that are the product of cultural activity. We should probe deeper. The American Heritage Dictionary of the English language helps when it defines culture as the totality of socially transmitted behavior patterns, arts, beliefs, institutions, and all other products of human work and thought. That's a mouthful, but it's a better, richer definition. I would like to propose a simpler form of it for your consideration. Our culture is formed by what we believe, what we think, what we cherish, what we honor. What we believe, think, cherish, and honor is expressed by the books we read, the stories we tell, the poetry we write, the plays we attend, the music we listen to, the paintings we admire, the sculpture we erect, the buildings we design, and so on and so on. Put even more simply, at the heart of culture is cult, what we cherish what we honor, what we worship. And what we cherish, honor, or worship tells us a great deal about who we are, what we value, and what we are capable of. There's nothing more important that we can know about ourselves and about others for good or ill than what we cherish. It's often said by historians that what we call Western civilization is the product or confluence of three great cultural streams, Greek philosophy, biblical religion, and Roman law. Here in Manhattan, Kansas, as indeed across America, 
We are the heirs and legatees of the cultural heritage created in Athens, Jerusalem, and Rome more than 2,000 years ago. We really do stand on the shoulders of giants. Now it's instructive to remember that in each of those ancient cultures, worshiping correctly was thought an absolutely essential part of social life. To cherish the wrong things, to honor the wrong heroes, to worship false gods, this was considered socially lethal in pagan Greece and Rome as it was among the people of Israel. Remember the great story of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai bearing the tablets of the law, a legal code that would help keep the Israelites from falling back into the habits of slaves. At the base of the mountain, Moses finds the people worshiping a golden calf, a false object of honor. In righteous fury, Moses tears down the golden calf, burns it, scatters the ashes in the water, and makes the Israelites drink the mixture so they will eventually expel the worship of false gods from themselves in the most literal way. To worship a false god, Moses insisted, was not just stupid, irrational, ungrateful. False, false worship, a false cult, inevitably led to a corrupt culture, and in a corrupt culture, men and women would begin to act again like the slaves they had been in Egypt, Egypt, the land of bondage. So here's a fundamental truth of the human condition that we ignore at our peril. If culture is the expression of what we are, what we believe, and what we cherish, if the heart of culture is cult, then to cherish false gods, whether that false god is a golden calf, ball, Zeus, gangster rap, unbridled material consumption, a culture of violence, is lethal to a life-affirming culture. We have to learn to distinguish false from true objects of veneration. For what we cherish and honor becomes a constituent part of who we are. We become what we honor. Now, what, you may ask, does all this have to do with public life broadly defined and politics more narrowly understood? Everything. We're too accustomed to thinking of politics as a matter of the machinery of government. But Thomas Jefferson didn't make the American claim to independent nationhood on the fact that the British Parliament wasn't working to his satisfaction. No, he staked the American claim to independence on certain self-evident truths that were explicitly moral in character. The human person has an inalienable right to life that right does not derive from government and is not granted by government. That right inheres in the human person and governments are bound to respect and protect it. Similarly with liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Now, if the foundation of the American House of Freedom are those moral truths about the human condition, then it stands to reason that the foundation will only remain solid when those truths are understood and lived by the people who wish to be the residents of that house of freedom, the people who are responsible for the house's maintenance. It takes a certain kind of people to make democracy work, and it means that it takes a certain kind of culture to make a democracy work, for the character of a people is in no small part a product of their culture. What we believe, what we think, what we cherish, and what we honor turns out on closer inspection to have everything to do with politics, if by politics we mean tending to and caring for the well-being of the house of freedom. And so we can extend the definitions in both directions. Politics is a function of culture, and at the heart of culture is what we believe and what we honor. The implication of this equation is both obvious and sobering. A humane culture, a life-affirming culture is essential for the politics of freedom, and a death-dealing culture, a culture that appeals to the basest human instincts is lethal for the politics of freedom. American democracy is not, as one constitutional historian famously described it, a machine that will run of itself. 
It takes a certain kind of people to make a democracy work, a people who understand the self-evident truths that human beings are endowed with certain inalienable rights, a people who knew and who know what it means to pledge one's sacred honor to the defense of these rights, a people who do not worship death-dealing false gods, idols for destruction as the evangelical culture critic Herbert Schlossberg has called them. In my judgment, the foundations of the American House of Freedom have eroded ominously. They have not crumbled yet, but there are cracks in the foundation of our democracy and they must be attended to. One way to test the cracks is to survey fellow citizens about the moral status of democracy. Too many Americans, I find, can give only a pragmatic answer to the question, why is a democracy morally superior as a form of government than anything else currently available? Life is complicated, they say, and so is our society. Giving everybody a voice, a handle on the levers of government is simply the easiest way to keep the lid on. That's the pragmatic answer one often encounters, but it won't work, not at least over the long haul. For in situations of social crisis created by economic difficulties, racial and ethnic tensions, or a grave national security threat, the answer to the questions, why be civil, why be tolerant, why be democratic, cannot simply be that civility works better unless we have seen in our fellow citizens, and especially those fellow citizens who may be of a different race, ethnic group, or creed, the bearer of inalienable rights like our own, the fabric of, civil the fabric of civility will shred under intense social, economic, or national security pressures. The breakdown of civility is followed inevitably by the breakdown of public order. We're seeing that in the news reels from Seattle, aren't we? The breakdown of public order is followed by anarchy. And because human beings cannot tolerate anarchy, they will reach for chains in order to regain some measure of control over their circumstances. The cracks in the foundations of the American House of Freedom, in other words, can lead to tyranny. What Columbine reminded us in the most graphic and unmistakable way is there are no guarantees that the American House of Freedom will remain that. Democracy is not a given. Nowhere is it written that the next generation of Americans will automatically enjoy the liberties of its parents' generation. Lincoln noted at Gettysburg that it was an open question whether a nation so conceived and so dedicated could long endure? That's a question that must be answered by every generation of Americans. Democracy is an ongoing moral experiment in a people's capacity to govern themselves. And only a certain kind of people can be self-governing, who have been formed by a life-affirming culture, people who are not, in the depth of their souls, utter pragmatists, people who do not worship false gods, people who are inwardly self-governing in terms of their appetites and aspirations, people who cherish goods worth cherishing and honor heroes worth honoring. When the founders stake their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor on the American democratic experiment, they didn't think that free government was inevitable, only that it was possible. And the founders believed that its possibility depended on a certain kind of people, a people who knew that freedom rightly understood is not a matter of doing whatever we like, but having the right to do what we ought. Freedom and virtue were inseparable in their minds, and that meant that the house of freedom must rest on the foundation of a life-affirming culture. As we stand on the threshold of a new century and a new millennium, we have just completed a decade of unparalleled peace and prosperity. These blessings may tempt us to think 
that the house of freedom is secure. Yet we know we can't ever be sure. That can't ever be the case in any final sense. There are adversaries abroad and we must take them seriously. In the quest for peace, freedom, and order in the world, America will have to bear a burden of responsibility far into the future. But for the moment, I should like to suggest that the gravest threats to the American House of Freedom and the greatest challenges to our country in the first decades of the 21st century are internal. One of those threats can be summed up in a phrase created a decade ago after the fall of communism by the distinguished political scientist Zbigniew Brzezinski. Brzezinski warned that the new threat to the United States and to the West in general was that we might decline into being what he termed a permissive cornucopia. Here in Kansas, where you help feed the world, you know all about cornucopias. What Brzezinski meant by a permissive cornucopia was historically unparalleled material abundance combined with a collapse of personal and public morality. The decadent cornucopia would be another way to express the same idea, that America might become, indeed may be becoming, a permissive cornucopia in which I did it my way is the new national anthem is another reason to think very seriously about the intersection of culture and politics. On the present trends, America seems likely to become ever richer as riches are measured materially. Yet the entire history of humankind suggests that enormous riches are enormous temptations. When we think of that having more is the index of being more, we're in deep trouble. The answer to the temptation of the permissive cornucopia is not to impose asceticism through governmental fiat. The answer is to rebuild a life-affirming culture in which we honor what is honorable, cherish what is truly lovable, believe what is true, think intelligently, and learn from all of that how to discipline and channel our wealth so it frees us rather than enslaving us. A further danger looming just on the horizon is a variant on the ancient Promethean temptation to steal fire from the gods. In this instance, to remake the human condition and refashion individual human beings by manipulating our newfound knowledge of the human genetic code. This new knowledge can lead to great good. It also can destroy us. If the revolution in biotechnology that will sweep over us in the next decade reinforces the idea already present in certain sectors of our society that human life is a commodity like any other, a commodity to be bought, sold, manufactured, or discarded on purely utilitarian grounds, then we indeed are on the doorstep of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World the only culture capable of channeling the explosive potential of biotechnology towards genuine human flourishing is a culture imbued to its depths with a deep reverence for human life. As the eminent bioethicist Leon Cass wrote recently, the most pernicious result of our technological progress, more dehumanizing, than any actual manipulation or technique, present or future, is the erosion, perhaps the final erosion of the idea of man as noble, dignified, and precious, and its replacement with the view of man as mere raw material for manipulation and homogenization. Legislation can't alone cope with the revolution in biotechnology. As Dr. Cass continues, important though it is to set a moral boundary here, devise a regulation there, hoping to decrease the damage caused by this or that little rivulet, it's more important to be sober about the true nature and meaning of the flood itself. And that means in turn deepening in our culture a profound, carefully nurtured, and unshakable commitment to the sanctity and the dignity of human life. 
About that commitment, we will inevitably become the creatures, even the slaves, of biotechnology and genetic engineering. Culture counts, then, for a great deal. Only a certain kind of people can live freedom nobly. Those kind of people are formed by a certain kind of culture. If we want our children and grandchildren to be able to answer Lincoln's Gettysburg question in the affirmative, it is way past time to attend to the cracks in the foundation of the American House of Freedom. This means the reconstruction of our culture through the reconnection of freedom to moral truth. In the 21st century, a century of great possibility and equivalent danger, the character of the American people will be tested as never before. Washington is a city that breeds cynicism, and to invoke the word character is to invite a cynical response. My friends, it's too late in the day for that. Character is destiny and has been since the Bible, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. The character of our people, of those who lead them and those who interpret public affairs for them, is the foundation, is the heart and soul of American democracy. And in this closing year, of the century and the millennium. Let us try to discipline our common talent for cynicism, to recover a sense of the mystery and wonder of life, and to rededicate ourselves to the renewal of American democracy through the renewal of American character. Living freedom nobly means that we all must avoid the worship of false gods. In doing that, we can give this nation a new birth of freedom the kind of freedom for excellence that made the United States a light to the nations, a bright city on the hill, the last best hope of mankind. Thank you. The congressman has indicated that he would be more than happy to answer any questions, and we have microphones on the right and on the left, and I think we already have somebody over here. So would you go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes. Um, you mentioned in your speech you talked about tolerance, and I was wondering, um, just before Congress let out before Thanksgiving, a uh, congressional resolution was proposed that would honor the contributions of the 50 million Muslim Americans and to make a statement showing tolerance towards this group. Um, however, you and Representative Thomas Davis III of Virginia went through this resolution and erased all mention of the word tolerance. Um, I believe that you removed a phrase that said that America was founded on the principle of tolerance. Um, you removed a reference stating that people shouldn't be made scapegoats because of their religious beliefs. And there was also a removal of a reference denouncing hate-inspired violence. Um, Representative Day, a spokesperson for Representative Davis said the reason why these revisions were made was to help speed this resolution through Congress. I want to know what the problem is with uh, a resolution saying that we should be tolerant towards uh, Muslim Americans. I have no idea. Frankly, I'm not familiar with the resolution. We certainly should be tolerant of everybody. Um, so the news story I heard was completely inaccurate? I, I can't hear you. So the news story I heard was completely inaccurate? I'm unaware of it. I, I don't know if it's inaccurate or not. It doesn't yeah. seem uh, appropriate. Yeah. Uh, there's no intention to uh, deprive Muslims of proper recognition in a resolution of that sort. That would be well, self-defeating, I should think. Yeah. Well, I don't think anybody consciously did that, and I don't know where your information came from. Uh, it was National Public Radio. Well, I'm gonna, They're going to get a letter from me then. I, I, I really... If the purpose is to indicate some of us are less than tolerant of Muslims, uh, that's entirely wrong. I think uh, the Muslim faith, like all other faiths, is a certainly a legitimate, appropriate, proper format for man's relationship to God and uh, is entitled to as much tolerance and respect as any other religion. So I don't think anyone would do anything 
in, in the opposite direction on that. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Yes, sir. Where uh, Representative everywhere. Hyde can't see. Over here. Okay. Uh, thank you for your thoughtful uh, comments. Uh, I specifically want to go back to your mentioning of uh, the worshiping of false gods, and I'd like to equate that with campaign finance reform, uh, a national system that uh, is obviously corrupt because of the massive amounts of money uh, contributed and, uh, in effect, controlling our, our national polit political leaders. Uh, Howard, former Senator Howard Baker was a landed lecturer recently and was asked a question about campaign finance reform and his idea was to limit uh, political contributions to individuals only. And I thought that was a rather interesting idea. I would further uh, limit it to uh, a cap of $1,000 per individual. And my question to you is, don't you think that's a swell idea? Yes, I do. I think the, I think the present limitation is $1,000 for each election, a primary and a general election. An individual can only give $1,000. A political action committee can give $5,000. What you're proposing is the elimination of political action committees, um, and I would have no difficulty with that. Um, the difficulty with all of these campaign finance reform proposals is you have to be awfully careful not to abridge freedom of speech. And people who can't work a phone bank or work a precinct or work a shopping mall, they can send you a check in support of your candidacy. And that is political advocacy, and that is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, many of these proposals um, uh, have to do with limitations on freedom of speech. Uh, I think the appropriate thing, and a, a, a limitation on what can be given is certainly um, all right with me. But I might suggest, if you think about it, running for the Senate, where you have to run through the whole state, um, and take a state like Illinois, which has 11 million people in 102 counties, or California, which is three times that size, um, a $1,000 contribution limit makes you have to ask an awful lot of more people to give more money, and you spend all your time raising money. If you could up the contribution limit, say, to $5,000, you wouldn't have the impossible burden of raising the millions of dollars it takes to run a campaign in a big state um, because of the small amounts of the contribution. I think it's a mistake to assume that because somebody gives you a contribution that you're bought and paid for. That danger is there, it can happen. If there is prompt and full disclosure, your opponent can make hay with that by saying, look who's trying to buy the fourth district of uh, New Jersey or whatever. But um, uh, it is not an easy problem. Public financing is very unpopular. You don't want your tax dollars going to support a Lyndon LaRouche candidate uh, or, or so something like that. Um, if more people would send a $50 check, a $100 check in, uh, then the insatiable demands, uh, the cost of running campaigns could be um, ameliorated. Uh, Free radio time, free television time uh, could be granted, although again, you're taking, uh, you're coercing from somebody um, part of their private property. But um, campaign reform is going to be with us. Uh, people are going to be thinking about it. Uh, much of the hue and cry about it, however, was, in my judgment, an attempt to divert attention from the president's difficulties, uh, but we will continue to uh, try to limit uh, the soft money, the huge contributions that go into state parties and the national parties for purposes of voter registration and that sort of thing. Uh, they can be, if they get too big, too corrupting. But you're not gonna take a guy like Donald Trump and say, Mr. Trump, you can't spend your own money advocating your own candidacy. I think that would be uh, 
an unwarranted limitation on the First Amendment. So we're just going to have to keep worrying about it and thinking about it. But I'm not uh, unsympathetic to your suggestion that only individuals make contributions and uh, that uh, there be a reasonable limit. I would want to raise it more than a thousand. That is the present limit. And I'm sympathetic to a candidate who has to raise 10 million to put on a credible race. In your speech, you mentioned uh, a life-affirming culture, and you mentioned uh, the erosion, I guess, of what we once had. Uh, could you give an example of, of where in our past uh, we have had less decadence than today? I think the uh, physician-assisted suicide movement has gathered momentum. I don't think you would have heard much about it 25 years ago, um, I think the acceptance of abortion as a means of family planning is a, a fairly modern, certainly since Roe v. Wade, 1973. Um, we, we are getting used to it, a million and a half abortions a year in America since 1973. It's just a statistic. Um, I don't think that is very life-affirming or recognizing that each human being uh, has uh, an immortal soul and a destiny and uh, uh, is entitled to due process of law and equal protection of the law. And I think the games we play defining the unborn as less than human beings are ludicrous and uh, self-defeating. So my own view is the terrible problem of racism, and it is a terrible problem, will never be solved until we all recognize that in each other we see a brother and a sister made in the image and likeness of God and entitled to the respect that all human beings are entitled to instead of treating people as subhuman or less than entitled to the same dignity as others, that has a spiritual dimension that we unfortunately can't include in our calculus because of the single-minded insistence on separation of church and state, which in my opinion is unhistorical because our founding fathers believed in the fatherhood of God and the Declaration of Independence, our country's birth certificate written by Jefferson and the, and the others, the founding fathers and the framers said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, meaning all mankind, all men, are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the government. So power comes from the creator direct to the people, not to the state and from the state to the people. That was the essential difference. And the source of our human dignity is the creator. That was the thought of our founders and framers, but it's mighty unpopular today. You better not teach that in school. But the question still remains, when was there an era that was less decadent today because before uh, abortion? I think before Roe v. Wade. But before abortion, uh, there was greater racism. You know, before the civil rights movement, it was basically a country of apartheid. I mean, blacks were segregated. Uh, well, you know, you, you there was a civil war. Totality, we killed over half a million of each you other. You want a moral uh, report? We, we massacred the Indians. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Uh, we're a country founded by a select group of white males uh, not letting women vote, not letting minorities vote. So when was there an era of less decadence? You didn't answer the question. Uh, I, I am unable to give you a moral report card on civilization uh, in America, but I can tell you we started with some very noble ideas in our Constitution 
and in our Declaration of Independence, and we've struggled and struggled and struggled. The carnage in the Civil War, which was fought basically to eliminate slavery as a legitimate institution in our country. Uh, I think the, those people who died in the Civil War fighting slavery deserve some credit. I think the troops who fought Hitler deserve some credit. Uh, the, tr the troops that fought in the South Pacific to protect freedom out there deserve some credit. I think you have a rather narrow view of this great country, flawed, imperfect, sinful, but struggling towards the light. do one more okay uh, thanks um, mr. chairman I'd like to thank you for your uh, service to the country in World War II and in the House of Representatives you've done a great job um, my question has to do with uh, I, I'm a c-span junkie I'll admit it um, I, <laughs> I uh, over Labor Day they had a special on Newt Gingrich and his rise to power and uh, they had in I think 1984 when uh, Tip O'Neill went crazy on uh, Newt Gingrich and Bob Walker, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, where were you, and had Tip O'Neill been uh, hitting the bottle a little early that day? <laughs> and uh, another question, uh, who's your favorite Democrat in the House of Representatives? <laughs> The, the first question was, where was I when t Tip and yeah, Newt where? got into it on the floor? Yeah. I was right there enjoying every minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and by the way, Joe Moakley, a Democrat from Massachusetts who was in the chair at the time, uh, held uh, Tip's words were uh, improper, contrary to the rules, and should be taken down. And that took an awful lot of chutzpah on his part, and uh, I admired him for that. Um, my favorite Democrat. Uh, I'd say mine is uh, probably Jim Trafficant, just to give you an idea. <laughs> Jim is so restrained. <laughs> uh, I don't know. There are several of them that I admire and like. Some of them have gone. Sonny Montgomery was a great... Democrat. Ralph Hall of Texas is a wonderful Democrat. Um, there, there are some more. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoy, uh, this may sound weird, but I enjoy Barney Frank. Uh, he is very clever. He, he tests your mettle. Uh, he's very fast. Uh, he's uh, very partisan. But uh, uh, he's a very worthy debating opponent. I, I enjoy. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I always wanted to say that. <laughs> let, me, let me leave you with a toast that I learned from Ronald Reagan's older brother, Neil, some years ago. And I always enjoyed it. And I, Send it to you. Here's to those who love us and to those who don't. May the Lord turn their heart. And to those that won't turn, may he turn their ankle so we know them by their limping. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming.